Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Inside MIT series session number two. I'm Alan Tate, the executive chair of the MIT Sloan CIO Symposium. And today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Stephanie Warner, who is the principal research scientist and executive director of the Center for um, Information Systems Research, otherwise known as CISR. And so welcome, Stephanie. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Excellent. Well, we're going to get to some questions uh, for Stephanie, but I want to start with a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, so, you know, the purpose of today's session is to learn more about Scissor. Uh, Stephanie is going to be a moderator for one of the panels at the symposium. Scissor has been a longstanding uh, supporter of the symposium and a provider of speakers. And so this is really an opportunity to learn more about um, what Scissor is about and how you too can get involved with Scissor. Um, I'll be talking to Stephanie for about the first half of the program and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, so during the first half, if you could just stay muted, that would be great. And then when we get to the second half, um, you'll be able to ask questions by raising your hand electronically. And you do that by going down to the bottom of your screen and clicking on um, reactions. And then there's a raised hand icon. And then I will recognize people uh, in the order that I see the raised hand. And um, by the way, I'm still admitting people um, as we're going. So I apologize for my looking away uh, while I'm doing this. Anyway, getting back to Stephanie, um, let me give a little bit of a brief bio of who she is. So she, as I mentioned, is the principal research scientist and executive director for the Center for Information Systems Research, otherwise known as CISR. She has a PhD in organizational behavior from Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, she also has an MA in organization organization sociology from Stanford University and an MBA from the University of Texas at Austin. She focuses on how companies use technology to create more effective business models and manage organizational change. And she's the co-author of a new book, Future Ready, The Four Pathways to Capturing Digital Value, released in October of 2022. So welcome again, Stephanie Warner. Thank you, Alan. It is good to be here and uh, can't wait for the questions. Let's see how hard hitting you are. Is this going to be softballs or hardballs? Well, you know, I'm going to start off with what I hope is a softball and ask for you to tell us just generally about Scissor and what kind of research do you do? If, I think if you could just lay the groundwork and give people an idea, because uh, I know you do a lot of wonderful stuff. Alan, I just want to mention that pitchers and catchers are reporting to spring training in a week. So I think Good. it's, a, a, I, I think, you know, major league pitching is okay now. Aha, okay. So I will be prepared and hope that we have a very good uh, umpire out there or else I'm gonna be in trouble. So let me tell you a little bit about Scissor. Scissor, uh, uh, which is what we fondly call the um, uh, Center for Information Systems Research, uh, is a research center in the Sloan School of Management, and our home is in uh, the IT department. Um, we have been around since 1974, so 2024 is going to be our 50th anniversary, and uh, we do research that is on topics of interest to senior executives. When we first started the research center led by Jack Rockhart, uh, the overarching question was, how do large companies get business value from IT? And about 10 years ago, we started getting many more um, uh, requests from not just the CIO and the IT organization, but from 
marketing, from boards, from the senior leadership team to talk about digital. What was, uh, what did companies need to know these what we call big old companies need to know about digital. And so our research focus has changed over time, over that time to become more about um, what do large companies have to know to succeed in the digital economy? We do uh, about eight research projects a year. Uh, so for instance, on our website, you'll see the 2023 projects. Uh, I'm working with Peter Weil on a project on um, uh, digital governance. You know, how do you think about who's responsible for the what and the how, and how do you make those kinds of decisions? Uh, that is one of the four explosions that we have in our book. Uh, we also have other research projects on, say, growing with X text. So. Alan Thorogood is looking at uh, what's the role of startups in the ecosystem. Uh, Nick Vandermulen is going to be doing a project on making talent a competitive advantage. And as I said, you can go to scissor.mit.edu and look at the research projects and uh, all of our other research too. Um, we have seven research scientists. So Peter Weil is in Australia, as is Alan Thorogood. There's me, Barb Wixom, who does research on data, Nils Vonstead, who does research on innovation, uh, Nick Vandermulen, as I said, uh, does research on uh, employee experience and talent and has done some research on um, decision rights. And Ina Sebastian has done some research, is, does research on typically ecosystems. And then we have a crack administrative team. And uh, so we couldn't do it without them. And that pretty much is, is what Scissor does. Again, it's around topics that are of interest and uh, are important to senior executives and so it's those topics, but then also we write about and publish in outlets that are going to be uh, outlets that those executives read in. So um, we don't do as much academic publishing, although some of us uh, have done, you know, Peter's done a huge amount. I have a new paper coming out in ISR uh, shortly. Um, Everybody's done some academic publishing, but a lot of our research is really targeted toward executives and written that way. So, um, Alan, I think that that's kind of the shorthand, you know, overview of uh, Scissor. Yeah, and um, so definitely we want to drill down into one or the two of those topics. Um, but but before we do. Um, could you just elaborate a little bit more about the process that you use at Scissor to do your research, you know, gathering the data, that type of mm -hmm. thing? I think that would be really interesting for people. Great. Now, I'm going to talk about two different types of processes, and uh, and these are pretty, they're used pretty much across Scissor, one or the other. Um Generally, Scissor, we have two, I wouldn't, I don't exactly know if I'd call them pillars, but I would say that Peter and I do lots of research on business models and on digital transformation. Um, Barb does work on uh, data monetization and AI and data liquidity. And then Nick does, as I said, decision rights, Nils innovation and Ina on ecosystems. Uh, and Alan on startups. And we all use one or the other of these methods. Um, so if you look at the work that Peter and I do, a lot of that is going out, talking to senior executives and figuring out what are the problems that they have. And it's on a very informal kind of basis. And then we get back together and we have a discussion about uh, well, I've heard this and I've heard this, and we decide that there is a question that keeps popping up. And with that, we start to um, collect information. A lot of times, once we have the topic, we create a survey and we do a survey 
that uh, has a couple of uh, data to go and, and deal with hypotheses, but is also, um, I, I stuff extra questions in it. Let's just face the fact. I just stuff as much as I can. Um, one of the problems that we are dealing with is that surveys are becoming much, much more difficult to deal with. Uh, and we're not able to get company names in a lot of surveys. And that is very important for one of the things that Peter and I do, which is always adding in firm performance. So we will then use that survey to help us refine and create a framework um, we then go out and do workshops and presentations and get the reactions and the feedback from the executives, and we iterate a lot. Now, the other, the other way of research, and Barb does this a lot, and so did Jeannie Ross, um, uses all of the same techniques, but in a different order. And typically, what Barb does is, again, she listens to her data board, uh, which is one of the uh, features at MIT Scissor. And she um, will do a set of interviews, like 30 minute interviews on a topic, and then look at across those interviews, see what looks interesting, and then um, pulls a, both a topic and a company that she thinks is really good. And she goes out and does a case study on that. And then from that case study, that helps her figure out how to create a framework. She may do a survey, but the survey is going to be at the end of the process where she is gathering some information to add to the presentation and uh, to give, to fill out some details around, um, you know, what are percentages of companies that are uh, following one type of data monetization versus another. So again, you can see one starts more with a survey and then builds the frameworks and does kind of not full case studies, but more case vignettes. Another one starts with interviews and then moves to a case study, then builds the framework and then does the survey. So uh, those are the, our two basic methods that we use in doing our research. But for both of them, there is a lot of working with executives, talking to executives, and iterating based on their feedback. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you know, kind of getting into some of the topics that you, you talk about, I want to start with one that you mentioned to me the other day. Um, and I want to start with it because I think it'll be interesting to people and they may not have heard about this. So um, this is the idea of domains and how you guys think that this could be the future of business. And if I'm correct, I think that you have a relatively recent paper on this topic that people could find on your website. But can you tell us a little bit about your domains idea? This is an idea that came about with Peter and I talking about what is happening with companies and this notion that uh, customer experience is becoming key to uh, driving a digital transformation. And we have this idea, we're in the process of researching it. I have to say it's actually harder to research than some of the other topics that we picked. But it's this idea that industries which have been an organizing framework for companies, you know, who are they competing against? Um, who do they partner with? Um, how are they um, evaluated? Industries are going to become much less important. And in fact, it's going to become the domain. It's going to become the, it's it's much more around the customer, the customer focus, and what is the need that the customer is trying to get fulfilled. And that means that um, companies are going to be evaluated compared to other companies in the same domain. So for instance, if you think about um, the home domain, the home domain actually has a lot of industries in it. 
Um, this is from some uh, research that where we were looking at cross tabs between industries and domains. And these are all perceptual data, but it certainly gives you an idea that industries just don't give enough information especially if you're looking at trying to fulfill a customer need. So the home domain has got uh, contractors or construction in it because, you know, somebody is building the house. You can also see that uh, we've got services in it from legal to realtors. Um, insurance is part of that domain because you have property and casualty insurance. Uh, bank banking, a lot of banks consider them the home domain to be very important because they have mortgages. And in some ways, there's actually um, kind of, an, uh, it, there's a battle for who's going to own the home domain. And we don't think that it's going to be, it's, it's not going to come down to one company. But it's interesting to us that a lot of these companies are trying to become the face to the customer. And so it's this idea of moving to a domain orientation. And we're still trying to figure out what exactly does that mean? So part of, I think that it has a, um, it very well could change the business model so that uh, you're really selling outcomes rather than inputs. Um, we're looking at how much partnering you need to do if you're going to become the face to the customer of that domain. I mean, just think of what it would mean if if you become uh, the leader in the home domain. It means that you've got to have a source of houses. You've got to be able to offer insurance. You've got to have somebody who can help sell. You're going to have the contractor services and you've got to do the financing. And so a company that's going to lead in a domain focus is going to have to really be great at partnering. Um, we're still playing with the idea. It's hard to find companies that are really, um, that have really, you know, moved wholeheartedly into this, um, into this type of thinking. I think, you could look at a company like Spotify that has become a company for small and medium and even large enterprises in terms of, say, back-end type of work. There's more of a domain type of focus. I don't know that they would call themselves a domain company, but so that's one of the ones we're playing with. It's we're trying to figure out what is the future of business and and what are companies going to need, the kinds of capabilities that they're going to need to build if business goes more toward this um, customer focus, maybe even extreme customization. Um, so those are that's one of the projects that Peter and I are playing with, you know, looking at data, talking to executives and saying, do you think, you know, are you thinking this way or are you much more of an industry focus? And I have to say, we're not finding a lot of companies yet, but we are finding some. Yeah. So, I mean, it really sounds like uh, you're seeing companies trying to provide a very friction-free and holistic experience from the customer's point of view as they focus on domains. That's, that's the, that gist. is, that is a key part of it is this notion that, uh, you're going to fulfill um, all, if not all, many of the steps in, and there's a piece that customer journeys um, are part of this. So it's, it's very hyper customer focused. Right. All right. So uh, let's just take a moment to talk about your book. If you want to hold it up one more time. Oh, it's, get back, get it's back big, to it's yellow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and get back to the subtitle, uh, which is the four pathways to capturing digital value. So tell us what's happening with pathways. So this research started in uh, late 2015, moving into 2016. Uh, and again, this 
grew out of uh, companies who, uh, our discussions with companies and our workshops with companies as they were starting to think about where, how digital was affecting them and how they were going to need to change. And they talked about their digital transformations, their digital business transformations. And as we collected kind of stories about what companies were trying to do, we realized that companies are were trying to change on two dimensions. They were trying to both become more operationally efficient and at the same time, they were trying to create a better customer experience. And when we asked these companies about the types of initiatives they were undertaking, it seemed that these were the two, um, these were really the two big types of initiatives. And one, I think the key lesson for us is that a digital business transformation, one is very hard. And two, the reason that it's hard is that you're trying to do two things at the same time, that companies need to be both more operationally efficient and more innovative at the same time. And those uh, often you have um, seen companies really go toward more one or the other, and they haven't had to do both. And as soon as you do that, you have a two by two. And so we have, um, when we ask companies what they were trying to achieve, they would describe things like taking out costs, but being more innovative, um, developing more modules that could be reused, having a great customer experience, needing to partner to bring in capabilities that we didn't have. And so as we started to think about it, we decided that this companies were trying to become what we called future ready. And then as we asked, well, how are you doing it? they described four different ways that they were trying to get to future ready. And we called those the four pathways. Um, and the four pathways are you can become, you can decide that you're going to become uh, first more operationally efficient, working on that uh, until you have um, either a set of modules that you're going to reuse that also are synergistic and help provide a cust better customer experience, or you just get better and better, and then all of a sudden you have time to devote to the customer. Um, so that goes up through the industrialized toward future ready. The second is uh, and these are companies that are typically under more threat. You focus everything on the customer experience, and then eventually you stop and you start to integrate. You re-platform, as we say it, and you um, move um, through what we call integrated experience toward future ready. The third is more of a stair step and more incremental approach. And that is one, that's most companies, if you if you make them choose one, about 42% of companies will choose that as their pathway. I think that feels very natural to them that they haven't committed all of their eggs in one basket. Um, there are issues about synchronizing the steps that you have to get through. And then the uh, last pathway is you throw your hands up and say, we can't get there from here. And you start a future ready business unit. And and the book, what we do is go into detail on each of these pathways, giving two case studies per pathway. And, um, and then at the end of the book, we talk about the capabilities that you need to build. And we come back around to value because what was clear to us in these, in these descriptions of a digital business transformation was you could you could create value, but who's going to get the value? What is the kind of value that you're trying to create and capture? And it seemed like to us, especially early on, that customers were capturing a lot of the value and that companies were not as sure. And so the last the last chapter is really around value. Uh, and we um, we create a dashboard that uh, it's a start. Um, some companies were like, well, how do we start? What are some of the um, 
what are some of the underlying dimensions of capturing value? So uh, we're still doing research on this. It's um, some of the research is a little technical in terms of looking at uh, regressions and trying to tease out um, like customer value. There's always a part of operations that, I mean, you can't have great customer value if you have lousy operations because I mean, as Jeannie Ross would say, your operational backbone is, I mean, your operational platform is really the backbone of your um, of your transformation. So we're still playing. We're still trying to tease things apart, but that's the book is um, what is future ready? The four pathways to get there. And then how do you go about capturing the values so that you actually have a successful digital business transformation? All right. Well, we are on a pathway towards opening it up to audience questions. and But I want to get a few things out of the way first so that we don't forget. And the first is, um, can you tell us how companies can get involved with Scissor? There are a couple of ways to get involved. One is, uh, do you have a great story? We'd love to hear it. I mean, we're always doing research. As you know, we're on this uh, annual calendar. And uh, so if you have a great story, contact one of us, and especially if you think it would fit into one of the current research topics. So that's on our website. I think that Alan put that into the chat uh, and contact the leader of uh, the head of that research project. Uh, two is you can um, you can go and read about our research. Uh, all of the research briefings are online. Um, it, you can read them in page if you would like. If you would like to download a copy, you do have to give us your email address and you do have to register. But once you do that, you can um, uh, you can download and share the research and many of our case studies, which are called working papers, are also on the website. And then the third is if you think that our um, consortium, we have 75 uh, global members. Uh, if you think that you would like to be part of the consortium and be part of the uh, the the events that we have, we do um, this year it'll be two in-person events and two online events. Uh, as well as um, uh, work with Barb's data board. Barb has a, a community of practice around data. And so she's got um, 80 uh, CDOs and people who are very oriented toward data who are on her data board. They meet four times a year and uh, talk about, uh, they help determine her research agenda. So those are the three ways. Um, be involved in a research project, read the research and share it, um, or become a sponsor. Great. Yeah, so in the chat, I just put the link to your current research as well as the link to your research library. Um, I gave two email addresses, your personal email as well as Scissor at mit.edu. Is there any preference in terms of emails as to which one? It's a little better for me if if it goes to scissor.mit.edu, but it actually it'll eventually come to me. If the, so, either one will work. Um, I now have an assistant, and she actually helps with this. So uh, I'm finally um, I'm finally digging out from my email deluge. <laughs> Lucky you! Oh my goodness! You know and, that? and she makes cappuccino too. This is like, how did I get so lucky? <laughs> you're you're making me jealous. Um, all right. Well, the last thing is I did put the link in uh, for people to join um, and and become a sponsor. That, that I looked at that web page has all the details. Um, and if you want more information, you can always send an email. So we are at 1030, and I want to give the audience an opportunity. So I'm going to remind folks that if you go to reactions and then you can click on raise hand like I just did, um, then I will recognize you and you can ask a question uh, to Stephanie, um, either about her book or about domains or about the Red Sox. 
Oh, the red, that would be tougher. I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with, um, there's a Super Bowl this weekend. <laughs> that, that is true. I'm going to visit my father. And so he and I are um, planning what kind of, um, uh, what kind of snacks we're going to have. So I, that's why I know there's a Super Bowl. <laughs> So, so where do we start? I don't see any yet. Irving, come on. Yeah. I, I know you have something. I, 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 I did want to ask a question, but I wanted, actually, Mubarak, do you want to go first? And then I'll go second. Sure. Mubarak? Uh, thanks, Living. Thanks for giving the opportunity. Uh, uh -huh. uh, hello to all. I am Mubarak Ali from India. Respected Madam, thanks for your invaluable insight. Extending my sincere thanks, uh, thanks to organizers for this opportunity and looking forward to read your book. Madam, my question is, what most important takeaway we want people to remember after reading this book? My second question, what problem were you hoping to solve with this book? And thanks for the opportunity. So I think that the most important takeaway is it it's not about the transformation. The transformation is going to take up lots and lots of your time, your leader's time, the time of everyone. But I think that if you don't keep value at the forefront and making sure that you're getting value, then the whole point of the digital transformation is moot. You, you haven't captured the value. I, I mean, there's both create and capture, but there is a piece there around capturing the value and making sure that it becomes reflected in your firm performance. Um, so I think that that's the most important takeaway. And it's the one that I think we're still grappling with. We feel pretty comfortable about future ready and the pathways, but the how do you get value? You know, it's that how that our executives come to us and they say, how do you do this? And we've really not done a good job if we don't talk some and give some ideas about how you create good decision rights. How do you develop your talent in a way that's going to have them um, better retention? The second issue around what problem were you hoping to solve with the book? Um, I think the problem that we saw was that companies knew they had to transform themselves and they had some ideas about what they needed to do, but they didn't have a way of talking about it and um, really having a common language about it. And so this idea of a common language and framework, even if it's not perfect, is going to help because you get everybody on the same page and you get them working toward the same goal. And that was one of the reasons that we thought that we had to write a book is that we had especially the, we had a lot of the pieces together, but they were, um, it's kind of like your data in your companies. It's there. It's in different places. How do you integrate it together? And then the reason to spend the time doing it is that many of these senior executives were not being able to communicate what it is that they were trying to accomplish. And this framework and these pathways gave them a place to start. And that was, I think, the big problem that we were trying to accomplish by integrating all of this material together. All right, uh, thanks for that. So Irving, you wanna go next? Yeah, Stephanie, the research is fascinating. Um, let me ask you, so you have about 75 companies that are sponsors mm -hmm. and they are the who is who of companies around the world. And uh, I wonder how many have reached out to you to ask you about the potential impact of foundation models, of large language models, 
is this a true paradigm shift in AI with potential business implications? Uh, how much of it is hype? Should I start paying attention to it? Should I wait? Uh, are you getting questions like that from some of your leading edge companies out there? Absolutely. Uh, and in fact, Barb Wixom, she started a project in 2019 on uh, what were the foundations of AI that uh, companies needed to be aware of. Now, when she started in 2019, there were 51 experimental um, uh, uh, projects out there that she found among the 75 um, companies. And she has followed those, actually 52 projects. She's followed those 52 projects. And, and what she has found is there's, um, some of them have fallen and have, you know, they were unsuccessful. There's a handful that are still in the pilot proof of concept. And there is a small number of them that are moving toward uh, doing what Barb calls scaling up and scaling out. And so she sees the issues around that first you have to get the project scaled up. And then if you're really going to um, create value and create efficiencies, you have to figure out how you're going to take that project and then scale it out. How are you going to use that AI and then do some reuse so that you're not building it all from scratch? Right. So yes, every single one of our companies has thought about this. They've been thinking about it since two, I, certainly Barb, that AI research kicked off in 2019. Now, uh, we're going to be doing, I think, you know, somebody's going to come to us and talk about chat GPT, but there's many other projects that are AI oriented that are not just like a chat GPT. Um, are they, are there a lot at scale? No. Have they, some, they have started to get value from once you get them up to scale, you start to get value. I think all of our companies would say this is not, um, it's not a fad, it's not going to go away. They, it's not a big part of their business yet. Um, so that's where we stand on it. I, we are continuing um, Barb's research this year. Uh, she has two projects and one of the, she's got, Competing on knowledge, the next challenge for scaling AI. So that's actually going to be not from like a Google or a Microsoft or an open AI point of view, but a what are the business problems that we have and how does AI fit? And uh, so that's, uh, it's still ongoing. Um, we haven't seen, um, we haven't seen companies uh, decide to give up on this. But, you know, Jeannie did a project early on and her her thought was get your small data right before you go to big data. Yep. I am hoping that foundation models will turn out to be for data that you build on what TCP IP turned out to be for networks. Foundation, you have to build on top of it but at least you don't have to collect all the data. You can leverage some foundational things out there. I'm hoping, but as you said, we are in the really early years. So, so. Especially in companies like that are our sponsors, big old companies. Yeah. Well, you know, in 2024, we'll probably have Jet Chat GPT asking you some questions, uh, Stephanie. <laughs> but, Peter told uh, me. Peter, but now we have humans. Yes. Well, Peter was playing with it. And then Peter said, Stephanie, you should have it write your bio. I thought, oh, I'm scared <laughs> yeah. about that. So ne next up is uh, Gritha. Uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Gita? Um, I go by Gita. Gita. Okay. Gita. Gita. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, thanks, Alain. And thanks, to, uh, Stephanie. Uh, it's it's great to know about the, your book and the research going on and being the kind of groundwork that is putting together, reaching out to various organizations, uh, understanding the gaps and pain points. So I recently sent uh, uh, my white, I mean, article to Alan, uh, of course, yesterday only is yet to review on the digital transformation and 
organizational change management that I put together with my 22 years experience helping clients and organizations on those things. So as you said, you've been talking to multiple executives and all. Uh, so it's it's a like known fact, 60 to 80% of digital transformations or ERP implementations, are, these are never been creating the ROI or value that is being expected out of it for a variety of reasons. So is there a way to figure it out? What might be the bottlenecks? Because I always see when I'm working with multiple clients, working with big four consultants, part of teams and all, we never do the lessons learned at the end to realize so that we no need to reinvent the wheel with the same repeated mistakes. So is there any way such kind of vetting criteria to avoid such kind of, you know, same mistakes and again, struggling with not able to create the value, not able to capture the value, because it's always a gap between the business and IT, digital transformations and all looked as an IT project rather than a, it's a business transformation, it's not an IT transformation. So it, that's it, where we it, always struggle to... Yeah, if you're just at the IT, that means that your senior executives are not involved. And that for us is, you have to get them involved early on if you want a transformation that is that big. It's just, that is clear. Uh, one of the issues in each of the chapters, we actually lay out what are some of the um, uh, stumbling blocks for each of the pathways. So for instance, if you're on pathway one and you're doing operational efficiency, one is for most of the organization that's not IT, it's not very motivating. You're just giving them lots of ways of changing the way that they work and they don't see any, they don't see any reason to be doing it because it's not affecting their customers. And so in that case, you really ought to be thinking about uh, loosening up and having some of the transformation budget go toward customer initiatives. On pathway two, where you're doing customer experience initiatives, it's very motivating, it's very exciting. And if you do not um, have a traffic cop, typically a CFO who's looking at cost to serve, you're gonna keep on doing initiatives that are not integrated and you will fall back even worse into silos and spaghetti, which is what we call where most companies are. They're in silos and spaghetti with this very complex landscape of processes, technology, and data. On pathway three, that incremental, those stair steps, that is around, um, are you synchronizing? Have you figured out how to go and capture the learnings from one step into another? And on create a new business unit, you have to decide early on what's your goal, especially if it succeeds. Um, if it fails, it fails. But if it succeeds, are you going to take the learnings and do you want to bring them back and integrate them in? Well, you better be thinking about that early on because you can't just all of a sudden have a success and now say, okay, now we're going to take the learnings. Are you going to create a separate business unit? Um, and is there a reason to do that? Or are you going to spin it off and capture value that way? So for instance, you'll see a lot of banks doing a digital bank as a path four. Well, if you haven't thought about what it means to succeed, you're going to end up with two banks. Well, and then do you, how do you get your customers over to the more efficient bank? And so that's a path for. So we do think about what are some of the, um, the stumbling blocks for each of the pathways. Thank you. All right, Kevin's up next. Great. Thanks, Alon. Hey, Stephanie, how are you? Doing well. It's not Good. minus six. <laughs> <laughs> so New York City is our marketplace. Uh, I've noticed for the last 20 years that the largest law firms and the largest consulting companies are sort of eating each other's lunch, right? Uh, they're each expanding out. This goes back to your example about domains, mm -hmm. where law firms want to be more consultative sure. and broaden the discussions, and the large global consulting companies want to give good advice that keeps their clients inside the guardrails, right? From a legal perspective. Is, is that the sort of example that you're talking about uh, from a domain perspective, or is, is that just the natural progression of these companies expanding out? That is a good 
that's one where I hadn't thought about that. When I've been, uh, we have some law for, we have one, at least one law firm that's on our, um, on our uh, sponsor list. And they haven't talked as much about the consulting, but that's a great idea. What they're talking about is how do they, um, how do they train and educate their clients about the technology that they're using and the issues? And so it's less about um, the, it's more about how do you become closer together and partnering, but I love your idea and I'm gonna write that down and start looking into that because I think that they're trying to figure out what their domain is and then, and it's probably around large companies and who's gonna be the face and who's gonna be, you know, and yeah. do the large law firms, uh, can they take over some of that consulting business? Great, yeah, you're welcome to, contact me after if you want some concrete gonna, introductions or examples. I would, uh, I will do that. I will get in touch with Alan and, um, uh, and Great. get your, uh, get your contact information. Fabulous. Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate Thank you. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Um, Mikhail's next. Yeah. Uh, appreciate the, uh, uh, description of the book. It sounds awesome. Uh, I'd like to understand the practical, um, it sounds like there are four pathways, which sounds like practical advice. So uh, uh, is there more in the book in terms of which pathway to choose? For example, you know, if you're in this industry and you know, your data quality is good, then you want to you want to try this pathway or that way. So um, I thought I'd ask that. OK, so we do have we have some very broad um, we have some very broad uh, 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 guidelines, but essentially pathway one if you can actually get through the slow parts getting toward industrialized is actually very good i mean that efficiency is is quite um it, it's good for your both your especially your net profit margin um if you're under a lot of threat a pathway two or a pathway four is useful um, pathway three is pretty safe, but there are issues, as I said, about making sure that you've got the, the uh, learnings. I can tell you all of the pathways get used in all of the industries. I mean, one of the things that we did at the beginning of the book is that we took one industry, we took financial services, and we showed, we showed uh, one company on pathway one, one on pathway two, one on pathway three, one on pathway four, and one that was on multiple pathways. So it's not industry specific. And don't you like my marketing mojo, pathway one, pathway, I'm kind of embarrassed that I couldn't come up with anything more exciting than <laughs> pathway one, two, three, and four. Um, what we do find culturally, Manufacturing companies feel very comfortable on a pathway one. That for them, that's just kind of the way their mind works. We see a lot of retail and a fair number of banks doing a pathway two because their industries, their competitive environment is really intense. And so they have to engage those customers fast. So those are some of the things that we talk about in the book. In on each uh, in each of the discussion on the pathways, we talk about pros and cons. We talk about things to watch out for. Um, and uh, at the end of the book, we kind of give an overall summary of it. We also have in the book we have some assessments. So we have ways that you can assess yourself against top performers. And as I said, at the end of the book, we have, um, we've put together a, uh, um, a draft um, dashboard because it looks from our research that dashboarding and keeping track of things, uh, being able to articulate the logic of the how and the what of making money is really important. And so being capable at dashboarding is really important. And so, um, we worked at putting together a dashboard around value. I don't think it's ideal, but I think it's a start. And um, for the companies that we've talked to around dashboarding, they don't get it right the first time. 
they typically iterate a couple of times before they get a good dashboard that one um, captures the business logic, two um, everybody will use, and three is motivating. I saw that Excellent. Andre had his hand up, but I don't. Know. Yeah, I was just going to say, Andre, did you have a follow up? I, I think you answered the question as um, Mikhail put it, but those assessments when. Um, I first came across your work on what's your digital business model. Those assessments were really good conversation starters to help us to diagnose and then begin to make sense of the complexity we were dealing with to then define, um, shall we call it a transformation journey. Now that you've got pathways out, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to get my hands on a copy. And I was going to ask, does each chapter come with an assessment? Does it give you a conversation starter? How will we make sense of the complexity and then best choose the becoming path that's required? I think in the previous book, the activation that was that was that was helpful out of those assessments is what I'm trying to see. Does that come through here as well? So that was my question, but I think you answered it. But more so on. I will say that I, each... I, I want to know about the activation thereof. Okay, the activation. Uh, one is, I think the activation is what is future ready mean for your company? What does it look like? So we actually have both an assessment and we have an exercise. This time we actually put an exercise in chapter one, which says, get people together. Here's the question that you, you know, here is how you start to create that common language. And, uh, then we have more assessments in chapter two around, pathway and explosions. I mean, I haven't even talked about the explosions that you have on each pathway. Those are the four big decisions that you have to make during a, um, during a business transformation. Um, Alan asked me about those after this, after I finished talking, what are the four explosions? And then, um, and then we again have more assessment at the end of the book. The pathways is really, um, uh, more descriptions and showing how companies implemented a pathway. So there's no assessments there, but at the end of each chapter, we have action items for each chapter. How do you do it? So we've tried to become, uh, again, exercises, assessments in the early stages and at the very end, and then um, action items for each chapter. Hey, Stephanie, there's a question in the chat maybe we could address. It is, how do companies pivot when being in the midst of a pathway and a disruptive development comes along? So this is important for some of the research that we're going to be doing now, is that in the last couple of years, most companies have been on a pathway, have stayed on a pathway. What we're starting to see in the last survey that we did that Progress is slowing down. And uh, we're what we think is that two things have happened. One is that companies have gotten the low-hanging fruit. So if you look in two, I'm going to give you data points from 2017, 2019, and 2022. We asked companies, how far along are you on your digital transformation? And we asked that in comparison to what you proposed to either the board or the senior executive team. And in 2017, companies said they were 33% along. We found in 2019, they were 50% along. So really nice, nice progress there. And in 2022, they were 55%. So progress, but slowing down. And so I think this is, uh, I think Bastian's question is a real uh, uh, impetus for us to do some more research in talking to companies, because I think that companies have hit that, um, they've either gotten the uh, low hanging fruit and how are they going to stay focused, or they've hit a disruptive development. And I'm wondering if Maybe not yet, but AI may turn out to be one of those disruptive developments. We don't, um, we're, this has just come along in the research. I think that companies, um, COVID actually accelerated all of this. So it was not a disruptive development to knock them off their pathway. Most of the pathway, most of the disruptions that we've seen were actually companies kind of 
um, kicking themselves rather than, um, you know, where they would be on a pathway one and rather than saying, yes, we're going to stay focused, you would ask, well, what's your investment, you know, patterns look like? And you would see that they were devoting almost no money toward a pathway one and it was all going over here. No matter, I mean, no wonder that you were slow. Um, so I think that we're going to start seeing more disruption and we have to study it. Okay, maybe so we have time for maybe one more question or a story. Stephanie loves stories. If you want to share one of those, oh yeah. Uh, any anyone want to have the last question or story? Well, Stephanie, I wonder if a lot of the reason why we need to evolve from industries, which feels like much more of a supply side concept to domains, which is much more of a demand side, is the growing complexity of everything out there in that, you know, so here you are a company and you say, God, Stephanie, isn't it great? I finally have implemented the internet applications. And you would say, yeah, sure, but that was very 1990s. And you say, well, now I have mobile internet and I have all this stuff, that's great. That's the 2000s. What have you done for, I don't know, what are you in enterprise blockchain? And, and have you heard about these big AI things? And eventually they'll say, Stephanie, give me a goddamn break. How do I, keep up, and I guess your answer is, it's not you, it's the marketplace that is getting tougher and tougher. Is that about what's driving this whole demand orientation is dealing I, with the huge complexity? I think so. I could not believe that Harvard Business Review Press let us put this in the, uh, at the, in the last two um, paragraphs. But uh, we wrote, congratulations, you're on your journey. And it's a journey that's not going to stop. <laughs> you're going to transform, and then you're going to transform again. And then you're going to transform again. And I thought, I can't believe they're going to let us say something so depressing. Um, but I think they, as a uh, company that has seen a lot of... Um, uh, information targeted toward executives really believe that, that it is, that this change is just a part of the everyday life of companies and that they're going, they just need to, and this is where your talent and your workforce development really comes into play, is that you want to have uh, people that are resilient and they're empowered and they're digitally fit. They know and are able to change along with the times. And I think that uh, Nick's talent research is going to be very important in helping companies mm -hmm. as they deal with this ongoing complexity. And I wish I could say it was going to stop, but I don't think it's going to. No. Well, Stephanie, with that, I want to thank you for joining us. It is always a pleasure to talk. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I look forward to meeting with you all. And I will be uh, I will be at the symposium um, moderating a panel. So uh, feel free to come up and uh, say hi. Sounds good. And, and a couple of other notes for our audience. I do invite you to join us in March. Uh, the date and time will be coming soon, but we'll have a discussion with David Vero, who is the executive director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, otherwise known as IDE. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, don't forget to register for the symposium on May 15 and 16 of 2023. And that's it for now. Bye, everyone. Bye.